Good morning. My name is Karen Mills, and it's my pleasure to serve as your service leader this morning. The Unitarian Universalist Faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We open our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world. And whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here this morning. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and so many others, whose rich languages, histories, and cultures continue to influence and make our community more vibrant. We also recognize that everyone here has a role to play to help build this community, and we do so by cherishing old friendships and opening our circle to include newcomers. We give thanks to those who volunteer their time and their talents to make these services happen. So please say a thank you if you happen to pass any of them today. And we also ask you to take a moment right now to quiet anything that beeps or tweets or squawks or might otherwise uh, interrupt our time together this morning. It's also our practice to stay after service and have a coffee and conversation and get to know each other a little bit better, so we invite all of you to share in that as well. We're so glad to have you with us this morning, and we hope you find something in our service today that helps you find your balance, nourishes your spirit, and prepares you for the week ahead. Before we go into our prelude, we do have, I know, at least one announcement from Rosemary, who's whispering behind me. Um, and then we'll ask if anyone else has announcements. Good morning. I do have some announcements. I gave her a not-so-subtle hint. <laughs> and uh, so uh, tomorrow night at Grafton and Blower on White Avenue, um, is I'll be there by 6.15, just a casual, uh, relaxing time of fellowship together to have a meal or a, a beverage of your choice. And so hope to see any and all there. Um, it won't be on Zoom for folks that are on Zoom. I'm sorry about that, but we won't be uh, filming that. Ruth has a question. It's right beside the candy it's store. Right beside the candy <laughs> store. <laughs> oh, right. And on Wednesday evening, I'll be hosting on Zoom uh, Book Club 21, the 21 Cardinals um, Saucier. It won the uh, Governor General's Award for Best um, Translation into English. It's from French to English. And it's not about cardinals like popes. It's uh, about a family of 21 children, and their last name is Cardinal. It's an excellent book. I'm just about finished it, so I'm hoping for a lively discussion on that and I just wanted to give you a heads up that there's lots of services coming up in December it is a time of celebration and so each Sunday there will be a service tonight also there is a quiet Vespers candlelight service for anyone that wishes to have a, a quiet meditative time to begin this busy busy season there'll be a mitten tree and what else Christmas Eve service blue Sunday and on uh, Christmas Day, there will not be a service, but the church will be open for those that find themselves alone or lonely, and the church will be open all day, and there will be food, games, snacks, carols, and a turkey dinner served at 5. What time is the Vesper service? The Vesper service is at 7 p.m. tonight here in the sanctuary. Thank you. So lots to put in your calendars. But for now, let us be present here and in the moment, and we'll begin that process by having a prelude.
going to light, um, ask Alex to come forward and light our candle, our chalice and, and our candle for Ukraine, um, both to remind us of the light within this room and the light that we really would like to see in the world. And while he's doing that, I have some words by the Reverend Eric Walker Wickstrom. Here today in this place and with these people, may we listen so we can hear. May we hear so that we can feel. And may we feel so that we can know. And may we know so that we can change ourselves and this world. And may this chalice we light, light our way. Thanks, Alex. And now I invite you all to either look into your hardcover hymnal or on the uh, screen in front, and we will join together in singing hymn number 225, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. As I'm sure all of your internet and social media feeds have told you, we're getting very close to December 25th. And so today actually marks the first Sunday in Advent. Um, you know, the placing of candles upon a circle of evergreen is an age-old tradition, and lighting additional candles each day or week as the light wanes has been part of human rituals for centuries upon centuries. And it's a tradition that I've always loved. Um, I grew up in an Anglican family, and so we always had the Advent wreath, and though my thinking around it has shifted a little bit, I, I love the, the marking of the time and sort of the anticipation that it builds and that delayed gratification and the, the excitement, um, but also the time to signal that you pause and reflect as things get busy and noisy and bright and distracting. And so today we're going to invite Gordon to light our first uh, Advent candle. And 
We're warmed by the glow of the candles and we're reminded that the wheel of the season will turn and the brilliant lengthening days will return. And the original Advent wreath in the Christian tradition dates back to the 16th century and included a candle for each of the 24 days leading up to Christmas. For us, in this time, the circle of evergreens reminds us that life and love will never end. And we light candles each week with anticipation as we know a new season will soon be here, the days will become longer, and we know that the warmth of the candles will soon be replaced by the warmth of the sun. Our first Advent candle is a candle of hope. Hope is the motivating force that moves us through times of despair. And we see that the days are getting shorter, the weather colder, the nights longer. But hope tells us that longer days are ahead, that new life will emerge, and that we need to hold on just a little bit longer. With hope, we begin our journey toward the sun and the new life it brings. We light the candle of hope. I don't think I introduced myself, but I'm the minister, just in case you hadn't figured that out. My name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve the Unitarian Church of, of Edmonton. So I'm going to read this story. It's called I'm in Charge of Celebrations, because we are headed into a month full of celebration. And it's by Beard Baylor, Baylor and pictures are by Peter Parnall. Now, I'm not going to set it on a thing and so that everybody can see all the pictures because, well, this is too many words. <laughs> I need to have it here. And so I read you this story. I'll show you the yard picture. Sometimes people ask me, aren't you lonely out there with just the desert around you? I guess they mean the bear grass and the yuccas and the cactus and the rocks. I guess they mean the deep ravines and the hawk nests and the cliffs and the coyote trails that wind across the hills. Lonely? I can't help but laughing when they ask me that. I always look at them surprised. And I say, how can I be lonely? I'm in charge of celebrations. Sometimes they don't believe me, but it's true. I am. I put myself in charge. I choose my own. Last year I gave myself 108 celebrations, besides the ones that the school, school closes for. I cannot get by with just a few. I'll tell you how it works. I keep a notebook, and I write the date, and then I write about the celebration. I'm very choosy about what goes in the book. It, happened, it has to be something I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. You can tell what's worth a celebration because your heart will pound. And you'll feel like you're standing on top of a mountain and you'll catch your breath like you were breathing some kind of new air. Otherwise, I discount it as kind of an average day. I told you I was choosy. I wish you would have been there for Dust Devil Day. But since you weren't, I'll tell you how it went. It, it, got, it was my first real celebration. You can call them whirlwinds if you want to. Me, I think of them as dust devils. It has a better sound. Well, anyways, I always stop to watch them. Here, everybody does. You know how they come from far away, moving up from the flats, swirling and swaying and falling and turning, picking up sticks? and sand and feathers and dry tumbleweeds. Well, last March 11th, we were all going somewhere, 
I was in the back of a pickup truck when the dust devils started to gather. You could see they were giants. You'd swear they were calling their friends to come too, and they came, dancing in time to their own music. We all started counting. We all started looking for more. They stopped that truck, and we turned around and around watching them all. There were seven. At a time like that, something goes kind of crazy in you. You have to run to meet them, yelling all the way. You have to whirl around like you were one of them, and you can't stop until you're falling down. And you think all day, you think how lucky you were to be there. Some of my best celebrations are sudden surprises like that. If you weren't outside at that very exact moment, you'd miss them. I spend a lot of time outside myself, looking around. Once I saw a triple rainbow that ended in a canyon where I'd been the day before. I was halfway up a hill, standing in a drizzle of rain. It was almost dark, but I wouldn't go in because of the rainbows, of course. And there at the top of the hill, a jackrabbit was standing up on his hind legs, perfectly still, looking straight at that same triple rainbow. I may be the only person in the world who's seen a rabbit standing in the midst, quietly watching three rainbows. That's worth a celebration any time. I wrote it down and drew the hill and the rabbit and the rainbow and me. So now, August 9th, is Rainbow Celebration Day. I think we should all put that in our calendars. I have Green Cloud Day too. Ask anybody and they'll tell you clouds aren't green. But late one winter afternoon, I saw this huge green cloud. It was not bluish green or grayish green or something else. That cloud was green, green as a jungle parrot. And the strange thing was that it began to take a parrot's shape, first the wings and then the head and beak, high in the winter sky. That green blue bird flew. It didn't last more than a minute, because you know how clouds are. They, they come and go. They change so fast. But I still remember how it looked. So I celebrate green clouds on February 6th. At times like that, I always think, what if I'd missed it? What if I'd been in the house? Or what if I hadn't looked up when I did? You can see I'm very lucky about things like that. Got to see the green parrot. And I was lucky on Coyote Day because out of all time, it had to be one moment only that a certain coyote and I could meet, and we did. Friend, you should have been there too. I was following deer tracks, taking my time, bending down as I walked, kind of humming. I hum a lot. I looked up in time to see a young coyote trotting through the bush. She crossed in front of me. It was a windy day and she was going east in that easy, silent way coyotes move. She pushed into the wind. I stood there hardly breathing, wishing I could move that way. I was surprised to see her stop and turn and look at me. She seemed to think I was just another creature following another rocky trail. That's true, of course, I am. She didn't hurry. She wasn't afraid. I saw her eyes, and she saw mine. That look held us together. Because of that, I will never feel quite the same again. So September 28th, I celebrate Coyote Day. Here's what I do. I walk the trail I walked that day, and I hum softly as I go. Finally, I unwrap the feast I've brought for her. Last time it was three apples and some pumpkin seeds and an ear of corn and some big, soft, 
homemade ginger cookies. The next day, I happened to pass that way again. Ginger tracks went all around the rock where the food had been and the food was gone. Next year, I'll make it even better. I'll bring an extra feast and eat that too. Another one of my great celebrations is called the Time of Falling Stars. It lasts, almost a mid, uh, it lasts almost a week in the middle of August, and I wait all year for those hot summer nights when the sky goes wild. You can call them meteor showers, I suppose. Me, I like to say they're falling stars. All that week, I sleep outside. I give my full attention to the sky, and every time a streak of light goes shooting through the darkness, I feel my heart shoot out of me. One night, I felt a, I saw a fireball that left a long red blazing trail across the sky. After it was gone, I stood there looking up, not quite believing what I'd seen. The strange thing was, I met a man who told me he had seen it too while he was lying by a campfire hundreds of miles away. He said he did not sleep again that night. Suddenly, it seemed that we too spoke a language no one else could understand. Every August, I remember that night. Friend, I've last left New Year's celebration for last. Mine is a little different from the one most people have. It comes in spring. To tell the truth, I never did feel like my New Year started in January. To me, that's just another winter day. I let my year begin when winter ends and morning light comes earlier, the way it should. That's when I feel like starting anew. I wait until the white-winged doves are back from Mexico and wildflowers cover the hills and my favorite cactus blooms. It always makes me think I ought to bloom myself. And that's when I start to plan my New Year celebration. I finally choose a day that is exactly right. Even the air has to be perfect and the dirt has to feel good and warm and on bare feet. Usually it's a Saturday around the end of April. I have a drum that I beat to sing, signal the day. Then I go wandering off, following all of my favorite trails to all of the places I like. I check how everything is doing. I spend the day admiring things. If the old desert tortoise I know from last year is about is out strolling around, I'll, I'll go in his direction for a while. I celebrate with horned toads and ravens and lizards and quail and friend, it's not a bad party. Walking back home, humming to myself, sometimes I think about those people who ask me if I'm lonely here. I have to laugh out loud. How can you be lonely with all of those celebrations? I would like to invite us to sing hymn number 170, We Are a Gentle Angry People. The words will up here, I chose this hymn uh, thinking about the two mass shootings in the States, the one at Club Q in, I know where it was, Colorado Springs, and at Walmart in Chesapeake, Virginia. We are indeed a gentle, angry people. 607 mass shootings in the States. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as you are willing and able as we sing one, hymn 170.
One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and in action. And in addition to supporting our community, we also take a monthly commitment and share it with the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash that is received here or the donations that are received via uh, the web online are shared with an outside organization. And for this month, we are sharing it with Make the Season Kind, which is CBC's Edmonton Food Bank Drive. And so we'll now take an offering, and I invite the ushers to take that offering now, um, that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit and offering that will support the self-supporting church and its many ministries, and your gifts will be most gratefully accepted. Following the offering, we will sing together from you, I receive. month we have been the focus uh, I'll have you look at my the little tree with the forget-me-nots and which is the um, symbol of our endowment campaign and I would like to invite Mark Grosh up to to speak to that thank you good morning I'm the third member of the endowment committee Endowment Fund Committee, get the whole name out. Uh, and I would like to ask you to think seriously about it. The Endowment Fund are funds that are uh, made available to the church uh, for special projects, usually. In fact, it was the Endowment Fund that made it possible for us to buy this church and to move from the other one, which became too small. There are two ways to give to the endowment fund. One is through your will, where you uh, denote a certain amount of money to be given to the church when you die. But uh, we don't always like to wait until you die. We sort of like to <laughs> have some hand money on hand beforehand. So another way to give to the endowment fund is uh, when a friend in the church or wherever dies and they ask to be remembered, rather than flowers, give a donation to the church and the family will be notified that uh, you have given in memory of that person. So there's the two ways of giving and the other way is just if you want to, put it in. There are envelopes at the back for you to uh, um, have to stop and breathe uh, for you to put a donation in and to give the the uh, name of the person you're honoring it will ask you if you can if we can acknowledge that uh, donation in church and if we can acknowledge the person's name so you need to give permission whether we can do that so that's it for our donation, uh, for, for the donations for the endowment fund. I hope that uh, you all keep it in mind as you're remembering people. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. First of all, I'd like to thank the endowment campaign 
uh, the Endowment Fund Committee for taking on this campaign. And I would like to thank those who have contributed to the fund. We asked, as Marg said, that um, if, you know, for people that have contributed, if we could announce their names and the names of they, those um, they're giving in memory of. And I have that list. And each one is represented by a blue flower on the tree. Susan Rattan in honor of Bernie Keeler. An anonymous donation in memory of Stan and Florence Campbell. John and Lynn Turvey wished us to remember Lila Slisney and Ada Nunning, Nanning. Dorothy Keeler contributed to the campaign thinking about the Ukraine. Lyndon Evans wants us to remember Bernie Hollingshead and Arlene Zydek. Thank you. Andrew Mills remembers his parents, Jim and Julia Mills. Gordon Ritchie, in loving memory of Rona Best. Jan McMillan remembers Nancy Collinge, as does Sheila Parr remember Nancy Collinge. Wish I would have known this person. A lot of people must have loved her. And an, an, an anonymous donation was made thinking about Reverend Brian Kiley's years of service to UCE. Gloria Krenbrink donated in memory, I didn't get the whom it was in memory for, as I didn't get whom, but Donna Hamer also contributed to this fund. There is a forget-me-not on the tree for each of those. If there is someone special you would like to honor by putting theirs and your name on a flower, please feel free to do so now. And if you are moved and are able, there are donation envelopes there for your convenience. And so we're just going to stop here, and I'll ask Gordon to play the, the spirit of life again as um, we just give people a moment to think and reflect if they would like to put another flower on the tree in memory of someone that they love. You can do this at any time during the service as well. I now, thank you, Andrew. I now invite you into a time of meditation. You were given a rock on your chair. It's, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. For those of you that are online, maybe find something nearby to hold in your hand that will fit in the palm of your hand. I invite you to focus in on your breath. Notice the way our chest rises and falls as we breathe in and breathe out. And notice the way that our bellies expand and contract to let this precious life-giving air in. Just focus on a couple of breaths. Feel the air going in and out. I invite you to kind of think about think about how your body feels. Are you holding any tension anywhere? Is there pain in your body? 
I invite you to breathe into any of those places that there is tension, where there is blockages, where there is pain. Pay attention to your heart. What have you been struggling with this week? What decisions have you had trouble making? What has felt right? What has made you uncomfortable? Now, think about this first Sunday in Advent of the hope we feel or want to feel. What is your heart's desire? What changes might you like to see in your life? Now really feel that pebble in your hand. Think about or imagine the pebble holding your hopes, your dreams, your deepest desires, your sadnesses, your disappointments. Think about breathing all those things into the palm of your hand and the pebble absorbing them. Hold this for about 30 seconds, and then Gordon will lead us into singing Spirit of Life. We'll sing it through twice, and the words will be on the screen. We now approach a time when we often light candles of joy or concern. Or concern. A little different today. Instead, we're going to release these pebbles into the cleansing water that has been prepared for you. You may also, at that time, pick up another pebble or two to re represent your joys and concerns. For those online, we invite you, I invite you to type your joys or concerns into the chat and to find a way to release the pebble that may or may not be still in your hand or the elbow macaroni or the bean that you found in the cupboard. This invitation is open and free. 
May this ritual bring healing, comfort, and understanding. I invite you to line up on this side and come around the tree and drop your pebble into the water, looking this way, looking towards the back of the church. Thank you. And now I ask Karen to drop one last pebble, holding all our dreams and hopes and joys and concerns. Thank you. Ready to emerge. I wish to start with a poem by David White, What to Remember When Waking. In that first hardly noticed moment to which you wake, coming back to this life from another more secret, movable and frightening honest world where everything began, there is a small opening into the new day which closes the moment you begin your plans. What you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. To be human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world is to live in your true inheritance. 
You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amidst other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. Now, looking through the slanting light of the morning window toward the mountain presence of everything that can be, what urgency calls you to your one love? What shape waits in the seed of you to grow and spread its branches against a future sky? Is it waiting in the fertile sea, in the trees beyond the house, in the life you can imagine for yourself, in the open and lovely white pages on the waiting desk? The acorn theory proposes, and I will bring evidence for the claim that you and I and every single person is born with a defining image. Individuality resides in a formal cause. To use philosophical language going back to Aristotle, we each embody our own idea. And this form, this idea, this image does not tolerate too much straying. The theory also attributes to this innate image an angelic or demonic intention, as if it were a spark of consciousness and, moreover, hold that it has our interest at heart because it chose us for its reasons. That's kind of an abridged from, from James Hillman's Soul Code. So the acorn theory has been used by philosophers throughout the ages. We heard some ideas from Hillman. He continues to discuss the idea of the acorn as a metaphor for how our destiny unfolds. And he brings forth this idea, this concept that it, the destiny calling or governing image inhabits our soul, whatever that is, our essence, whatever word is comfortable for you and that it has arti been articulated through the ages. For example, this can be found in the Kabbalah, Buddhism, Hinduism, Plato's Republic, and many indigenous cultures. In the context of emerging, however, the acorn analogy is taken to the next level. Locked up in the seed of your soul or your essence is not just an image, a calling or a pattern of potential. It is the fully realized self formed in the invisible dimension of your being. And while it makes use of the raw materials of your life to take shape, it is not dependent on anything outside of you for its existence. It already possesses the power and substance to manifest whatever it needs. The truth, as the great spiritual masters have taught us, is that all of life is conspiring for our awakening and fulfillment. Just as there have been plants that require rough soil to activate chemicals that can make them hardier and better to thrive in the environment, in his book, Emergence, Seven Steps for Radical Life Change, Derek Riddell says, the challenges I faced created the perfect conditions for my growth, compelling me to push my roots deeper and strengthen my inner structures, like certain seeds that need a forest fire to germinate. Those early childhood experiences sparked a fire within me that cracked open the seed of my potential and allowed it to grow. What I can now see is that all these powerful promptings were my acorn, or true self, guiding and directing me, creating opportunities for me to cultivate the inner and outer conditions necessary for its emergence. The same process is true for you." End of quote. So Derek Riedel, 
Rydal, Rydal, I don't know how to say his last name, is a writer, an actor, a spiritual leader, and a licensed integrative therapist. He says he tried to become a monk and then a minister, and both of those didn't work out so well. In his book that I just quoted from, he tells the story from a time when he was doing these big workshops telling people they needed to change. They needed to self-improve. One time, though, he could tell his audience wasn't buying it. And so he dug in deeper. He tried to make them believe they could attract what they needed if they just tried hard enough. In his quiet desperation and while on stage, he, he realized that he had it all wrong. That the model of personal development was absolutely wrong. And he could see why his talk wasn't working. And he didn't believe it anymore. And he realized that instant of lacking something, everyone is whole, just as they are. He says, just as the oak is already in the acorn, everything we're meant to be and all we need to fulfill it is already in us. A perfect pattern and divine purpose. And like the oak from the acorn, when the conditions are right, this innate potential naturally emerges. And so he looked down at his audience and he told them that they needed to stop trying to find that thing they think they are missing because they are not missing anything. He called it the end of the self-improvement movement. But I don't think the self-improvement movement has gone anywhere. Maybe it's shifted and moved into another way of thinking about how people become their best selves, perhaps. I haven't been down those aisles of the bookstore lately. I, d I don't know about you, but I've always been a, a little bit uncomfortable with the law of attraction. <laughs> I had some agreement. Thank you. Uh, if you aren't familiar with this idea, it is the theory that you just need to ask the universe for what you need, and it will happen for you. I worry that kind of thinking leads people to believe they haven't tried hard enough. Or that, what if they're, a person's a refugee? Or the victim of a crime? Or they get a terrible disease? Have they brought it on themselves then? Have they just not asked the universe for enough safety and health? I believe this kind of thinking is dangerous because it blames the person that is in war for the war or the violence, or the disease, and it tells them that they just aren't enough. They haven't tried hard enough. So this way of thinking is different than visualization. Who, who uses visualization in their workaday lives? Yeah. Sports and other uh, types of coaches use visualization to great effect. Uh, for me, the idea is that if I can't see myself doing it, if I can't visualize it, I, I can't actually do it. So coaches use it for hockey, basketball, ballet, whatever. So anytime there's a high level of skill or creativity being developed, visualization is often a strategy to getting the person to the Olympics or onto the operatic stage. For me, I often use visualization seeing myself doing something before I can learn the skill or have a successful outcome. Some might call this daydreaming. I love daydreaming. I think it's an important way to spend your time. I used to think that my time, the time that I spent daydreaming was totally wasted. However, I've come to understand that we need that time to gaze out of the window or sit in the forest, to put everything aside and just let our minds wander and take us on some wild and often creative journey. How many here love to daydream? Yeah, most of us, probably everybody. But the law of attraction would have us believe that something is lacking, that a person needs to attract something in order to develop and become successful. 
The laws of emergence, contrarily, states that we are whole. And the world is waiting and needing that which is within you to emerge and mingle in a world, in the world, and to make it a better place. It's sort of like the old hymn, Don't hide your talents under a bushel. Let them shine. It's the idea that there is a wealth of gifts and skills and talents waiting for the invitation to the game, waiting for us to acknowledge that we have so much to offer the world, and so much to offer Edmonton and this congregation. For me, this idea that I can become, that all I can become is already there, seems difficult for me to imagine. It certainly didn't seem, doesn't seem like it was already there when I look back at the trajectory of my life and I notice that it looks like a pile of tangled rope. Was that because there was something inherently wrong with me? I don't know the answer to that about me or you, however. Throughout the ages and across dimensions, the magic of the acorn exists. From the Book of Shadows, the acorn represents change, growth, hidden secrets, strength, good luck, protection, wisdom, and personal power. I should have put acorns on your chairs. Oh well. Have you ever thought about yourself like when you were a child? Were you imagining, was there imagining or feelings or desires that you had then that you can relate to now? For me, as I began to untangle my trajectory, I began to capture some of that lost youthful enthusiasm. Some characteristics seemed familiar and age old, and I certainly found some hope. Let's take a moment for us to think about that. How do we capture or nurture those innate qualities that are within each of us? If you're willing and able, I invite you to do a little exercise with me. Take a couple of breaths. and Put your feet on the floor if you like. And then with each breath in, picture light going into your heart. And then with each breath out, release something that isn't true for you or about you. Picture yourself bringing in light and love and letting go of something that no longer serves you. Recall now a time when you felt really connected, loved, vibrant, fully alive, and energized. Be in it. Feel it again. As you breathe, let that feeling expand into your whole body. From this place, allow yourself to vision what it is that you truly desire, what it is that makes you come alive, what gives you energy and bliss. Allow yourself to see and feel your highest possible vision. Paint the picture of you, fully you. See yourself being praised and congratulated and feel the love from everyone around you. When negative talk comes, thank it and let it go. How does this vision make you feel? What exciting and creative things did you envision yourself doing and become and become? I invite you now to begin letting go of this exercise. Bat your eyes if they were closed. Look around. Notice things in the room. Take a few more breaths as you come back to the here and now.
just as the acorn holds the promise of an oak. When given the right soil, within us is the promise of beauty and wholeness. As you see yourself moving into your week ahead, remember it's not about attracting things to you, but rather allowing your true self to emerge and then watch for the love and healing that follows. So may it be. Amen. I invite you into about 30 seconds of silent reflection. closing hymn for this morning is number 1017, Building a New Way. It's one we're not quite as familiar with. We have sung it once or twice before, but maybe I'll ask Gordon to play it through once, and then we'll join in. the words last time and we left anyway both times I will admit it I edited it and the third time will be the charm so don't <laughs> don't miss that all right could I invite Alex forward to extinguish our chalice and our Ukraine candle please and while he does that I have words by Emily Richards may you leave this time together changed May the promises you have made to yourself about who you want to be feel closer to the reality of who you are right now. May you share that feeling of transformation wherever you go, and may it spread into every word, deed, thought, and interaction until we are all changed and changing, transformed and transforming together, becoming our better selves. I would like to thank everyone here for being, for, for being here this morning and for you that are online this morning live and 
later on on YouTube if you're watching. So glad you're here, and I want to thank all of the people that uh, contributed to this service. Tech, music, service leader, chalice lighters, contributors to the endowment fund, Mark for speaking. So many hands go into this. So many hands. Greeters, slide producers. So I just want to thank each and every one of you. We can't do it alone. And now I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and they can be mended but not with time. As they say, they can be mended with intention. So go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly and above all, love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is within you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And I invite you to stand and sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. Turn and look at one another. See if you can catch someone and look them in the eye and let them know you care. Mm -hmm.